Welcome back to Bullet Catch Gaming. This is, of course, Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Recently, we made a video called Gunsmith, what we need and how to fix it. Um, and on that video, I was joined by um, Jeremy from DangerClosedigital.com. And also joining me today, along with Jeremy, is also Ed from the Discord, uh, aka Tyrant. And he, he loves his weapons too. And we are going to go into the feedback based on that video. Um, we had people, um, obviously, were quite pleased that we'd made that video discussing the things that, you know, that they'd like to see changed in the gunsmith, along with, you know, things that obviously we wanted changed. But the other thing is that some people wanted certain things clarified. Other people had other ideas or things that they wanted added. Um, so we're going to discuss those. We're going to go through the YouTube comments um, as we go along. or well, some of the comments, not all of them, with us will be here forever. So let's get going. Um, so Ed and Jeremy, are you ready? And we're going to get into these. So I'm going to pick a few comments off the top and we're going to discuss them. So the first one we're going to discuss is from Wyatt Delamar or Delamare. Um, he has said that he would quite like to see the C-79 Elcan from the Canadian Forces, and along with the Division 2, and also the 533 Hollow site. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about those? Well, again, um, as we discussed offline, I, I think that uh, most NATO uh, members should have their uh, their firearms and their camouflages and the uniforms properly represented in the game. Um, I totally agree. Uh, you know, if they can if they can shoehorn in as many optics and as many guns um, and as many camos as they can, I'm all for it. Um, I, I don't I don't see any reason why not to. Considering how how embedded those, in particular the Elcan, how embedded that is with the gun culture right now. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Two Niner has said that he would like to see a ground uh, ground branch level of customization. Now, we did discuss other games like Tarkov and Modern Warfare. Now, I personally haven't played um, ground branch. I don't know if either of you two have, have played it, but I did look it up, um, and the customization does look pretty decent. Um, have either of you two played it, or, or what do you think about comparing Breakpoint to other games of in in the same in similar genre anyway. Yeah, I, well, I've got a couple hours of Crown Ranch. Um, the uh, the gunsmith there and the gunsmith in Ghost Recon it couldn't be any more night and day. Uh, they're two completely different beasts. Uh, I would say that uh, I would that would be great. Um, however, being able to fit it in with a control scheme that would fit both PC and consoles. Uh, is always an issue. Um, there's also the issue of going a little too far, to, too far into the weeds with it, uh, losing some people. Um, but uh, anything they can do to to, to uh, make the gunsmith better is is a welcome change, in my opinion. Uh, I think all of these suggestions are all great suggestions in their own right, and I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be considered. Um, so I mean. I don't want more to say about that. Okay. Now, on that previous video, we did discuss about the fact whether they'd had a military advisor, um, and we said we weren't actually sure who that was. Um, Alexander Sanderlands has said on the comments of that video, um, and I spoke to him afterwards about it, um, that Emil Dubon, the former US Green Beret, was the advisor on the game. Um, what do you think that the job of the advisor should actually be? Um, do you think that they should have separate advisors for spe different specifics? So an advisor for weapons, advisor for survival mechanics, um, an advisor for, I don't know, even possibly even vehicle mechanics, maybe. I mean, you know, um, there's a lot of people who say that they want classic flight controls compared to others. You know, it could be that you bring in someone who knows more about helicopters. I don't know, but then where do you stop? You know, you could go on right. forever. What, what do you, what do you guys think about 
What do you guys think about well, that? I, I, what about you? I got, two things. I got two things about this. First off, an advisor is just an advisor. They give advice. It's up to the up to Ubisoft to actually implement that advice or pay attention to it. So just because they had a military advisor on the game doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to translate into the game. And that being said, I do think that they need to have advisors for uh, subject matter experts for various aspects of the game. Things like we talked about in the last video, a uh, ballistics expert. Uh, if you're going to start getting the weeds about your ballistics and start doing uh, uh, modifications to weapons based on ballistics, then I think you should have somebody that knows what they're talking about with that. Uh, that's a really touchy subject. A lot of us gun guys uh, get really funny about, about the ballistics on it, so that's a real stickler. Uh, it's also one of the draws to this game is you're going to get a lot of the guys that are more tactical and 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 uh, more of the gun uh, culture guys in here. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if they could have a, an advisor for for uh, CQB tactics and long-range tactics, um, just just experts in various fields. If, if they're going to touch upon those fields and uh, utilize any of those things in statistics and, and uh, uh, gameplay, then I think they should be talking to someone who actually knows something about what it is they're trying to implement. So I, I, I think they should get as many advisors in there or anything that they can possibly get, just because you get just because you get a green berry in there doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be the be all end all of every subject. So, you know, he he may be he may be an expert in par parachuting, he may be an expert with firearms, but I guarantee he's not an expert on every single thing. Otherwise, you'd have one person training you throughout the military, and uh, and we all know that that doesn't happen. Everybody has specialists that train you. Um, and they should have specialists that come in and advise on each each one of these areas of uh, of interest in this game. No, I completely agree with you because when it comes down to it, uh, if if I was going to bring in a, a military advisor like like that that gentleman who was involved, I would have wanted to utilize him for you know the way that the character moves when you're you know when you're clearing and you, when you're assaulting bases and things like that it would have been for more military tactics and stuff like that and you know and bits to do with the gear and make sure that the right gear was being used all that kind of stuff um i'm not sure obviously we don't know what he did or what input he had um us mentioning him obviously is no it's no knock on him whatsoever um, we have no idea what they asked him advice for, so I completely agree. I think um, having different people for different roles would probably be the way to go. Now, um, DJ Jamon, 1979, said, now, some people, th this will be controversial to some people, but I do get it because some people do enjoy this. He said, I'd be happy if they increase the gunsmith's, uh, gun, the gear score to 300. Now I know that there I st I know people who still play the game normally um with gear score on and it's not because they want to raid it's just they like um they like the perks that you get on your weapons by using gear score um so but obviously lots of the guns are set at 250 you can't get 300 versions of them, uh, especially on a lot of the new weapons that were added in, say, Amber Sky and things like that. Um, do you think that, I mean, I know that most of the communities, and I don't speak for the community, obviously, um, but I know just from reading people's comments and things like that, that most people don't enjoy gear score at all. Um, do you think this is something that you, that should be changed for the players that do like gear score do you think that they should go in and put every weapon at 300 i mean really i suppose they should if if gear score is still part of the game they should really go and do it um and not have some weapons at 300 and some at 250 if, if you guys got any anything you want to add to that yeah do you got anything on this in response to whether or not they should implement it into the gunsmith I, on two hands, I have a yes and no. 
No, I don't believe they should because at the end of the game, whenever you apply gear score to it, you enforce a looter shooter roll. And that looting is where you have a lot of replay value. Whereas if you just give it to them, they no longer have that replay value other than just doing the normal missions over and over again, like us in um, where we don't have gear score on. So on one hand, yeah, it'd be kind of cool if they would allow all these new weapons to be implemented uh, and built with like 300 gear score. But on the other hand, I also see them increasing the pool. I would like to see them increase the pool for those who say go into wolf bases that could be your incentive get into a wolf base and you have this chest there that if you can sneak in and grab it or destroy everything and grab it um you have a chance for a weapon and that weapon could be anywhere between 275 to 300 there's some replay value there and it's not just the usual weapons that you had whenever the game started now you can throw in to kind of broaden that pool that gets a little hairy. I know a lot of people don't really like it whenever a pool is brought and they want to get the weapon they want right now. But there are other people who enjoy that type of grind. Should an option be there? That's debatable. I don't know. If you just give it to somebody, then obviously they're just going to run around with it. It's giving them a new toy to play in the same playground over and over and over again. There's a lot of fun you can have with it, but eventually it's going to wear itself out. Whereas if you hide that toy and say, it's out there, go find it. Now they have incentive to go out and get it. It's that piece of candy that everyone wants to go for. I think, so. I think what he, I think what he's saying is though, is that you can, if you go on the normal game, you can obviously build your gear score up to a certain level with off the top of my head, I think it's 252. Um, and if you then obviously rage you, you, by raiding over and over again you can get your gear score up to 300 what i think he's saying is is that even in the raid for example you could have a 300 gear score i don't know 416 but they go and add a new weapon like they did in amber sky the 4ac and you can only have a 250 4ac that you cannot have they haven't set it so you can have a 300 4ac so you can have a 300 on a lot of the base weapons and a lot of the newer weapons are only at 250. And really, I feel that they've done it because they just don't care about gear score anymore. Um, so anyway, um, you know, I, any, it, I have something to add to this too. Go on. Uh, from, a business, from a business perspective, um, you know, they sold this game uh, to the top brass at UB. Uh, with the idea of these rage, which didn't turn out, you know, they didn't pan out. Um, but uh, but locking the gear score at 252 for for non-raid weapons um, provides an incentive for them to go and actually try the raid. Um, so the more people they get on the raid, the more they can push back on people that say the raid was a failure and say, hey, look, we got tons of people playing this raid, even though they're only there trying to get the 300 version of the weapon uh, in question. But uh, and I and I do agree to you with you that uh, uh, if they're going to have a gear score cap of, that's lower than the potential maximum, then all those weapons should be seated on on Golem Island. You should be able to find all those weapons and have every weapon have have the opportunity to get to three hundred. Uh, that's that's kind of where I disagree. Uh, that's kind of where I disagree. I'm not saying that they need to restrict it down to just you know the base game weapons. I'm saying that the weapons that you have being introduced can go into the loot pool just like every other weapon. Except now you go into wolf bases and stuff on the main island. If you don't have people on to do the raid with, or you can't find people to do the raid with, or you just don't like the raid, you can go into these things. But it's going to be those weapons. It's going to have the same basic perks, just like every other weapon before it. Uh, but it's going to be the new ones. The raid should be an incentive to go over there because you have these cool new weapons with their own unique uh, look, their own unique uh, perk. Uh, what makes that weapon, you know, the weapon that you want? For instance, the fully automatic pistol that you get from Ball. There's your incentive already. But again, some people just don't like the raid. So what about them? Are you going to kind of shaft them? It goes two ways. So if I, you wanted I had, to put... I had to grind the raid to get the weapons that I wanted. 
Just quickly, I mean, while it was bigger. Yeah, me too. But just quickly, while we're on the raid, before we move on to the next comment, um, do you think? Because this question comes up a lot, and this has come up so many times. Do you think that? And this is kind of gunsmith related in a way. Do you think that the raid weapons that should be available now um, in the store as a, a for, as a buyable, you know, purchasable blueprint? Do you think the time has come? Do you think as as this game goes on towards the end of its life cycle, they will be added, like the you know, like you said about the CSP uh, ball and the um, the M eighty two Cerebrus and the Coblin and things like that? These are guns that people want. Um, and they don't want to play the raid, especially the more difficult raid, to get um, two of those three. Do you think that? Do you think that might happen? I think it'd be a good business decision. We know. I think it'd be a good business decision, but if it were up to me, I wouldn't do it. I would leave the raid weapons where they are. Um, obviously, you're still wanting to turn a profit, so at this point, that decision wouldn't turn a profit. But you also have the guys who hardcorded that thing uh, from day one up to the point where they said, right, Golem's going to be the only one. And they still go in Golem. They do it every week. Yeah, and there is, that, a, there is a community out there. And yeah. it, it would. It, it, it's, I've spoken to a lot of them, and they're probably split 50-50. Half of them kind of say they have no problems whatsoever if these weapons are in the store. And the other half probably say, yeah, we well, would have a problem because it's like they, they, they worked hard for those. And, it's, and I can see it from both sides, really. I, I do see it from both sides. But anyway, we're, we're, we're getting on to things that aren't really about what we were talking about. So um, like Ross Hickson has just gone on to the point we were talking about a little while, a little while ago where he was talking about the advisor in the game who we mentioned um, and he said that um, Ubisoft actually said somewhere that he was there for the survival aspect of the game. So that may be an indication as to why there are so many issues with the gunsmith that we brought up in the original video. What do you think? Yeah, I think that just reinforces what I had said before about, uh, you, you know, he may be giving advice, but he may, they may not take it. Uh, that uh, there needs to be subject matter experts for each aspect that they're going to utilize, uh, and that no one person knows everything about everything. Dude, so uh, I, I, I feel like it just on, backs up what we already said. To pitch in on that one, I think we need to do away with the advisor. I think we need to start looking more to it as a consultant. If you're wanting to uh, apply stuff that is requiring some sort of specialist to come in you're not going to ask for much of his advice at that point because that's a little bit too broad saying oh yeah i took your advice doesn't matter again like he said guarantee that i'm going to follow your advice but if i'm going to consult you on it i don't know it seems like a more professional term and it seems like there's a little bit more serious uh, seriousness to it well um, considering that they've got ghost they, recon they got rainbow six siege and they got uh, the division, it, it would probably behoove them to actually hire on a full-time consultant on this so that can work on all three games. Uh, bring in people of subject matter. I mean, this is going to go back a ways, but uh, Private Ryan, same Private Ryan, had Dale Dye come on and had them go through basically like miniature training sessions to get into the vibe of actually being a soldier. Um, and what was it? Medal of Honor, the newer one, they actually had weapons experts come out and have them go to the shooting range with them. They would describe what the guns could do, couldn't do, their kinks, yeah. their quirks. Well, they did that with Ubisoft, too. There's, there's videos on YouTube of them going out there and doing it. But the problem is, is you can't call that training. Going out for one day is an experience. Doing it repeatedly and getting good at it is training. Oh, yeah, no. But, I mean, as far as the Dale Dye perspective, he had them work days. They weren't just there for a day. They were, I believe, from... Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I think the point is is that for the gunsmith, for example, and trying to fix the issues with a gunsmith, I think you need somebody who knows weapons and works with weapons inside and out, really working with them 
on more than just a they they went in for a week. You know, I think it exactly. these games take years to develop, so they need to be there. Really, they should be hired as a full time member of, of of the team until the game is released and then still be utilized later on when new weapons are being added into the game so they can say i've handled this this is what this does this is how this reacts this is the recoil of this you know i i think they need to be they need to have someone on full time for each game so it's not like ubisoft should bring on one person and right you can work on the division you can work on ghost recon you can work on our new star wars game you can work at because then it's going to get saturated. They need someone to work on each game, I think, personally. But anyway, let's move on to the next point. So Kichuar Band has said, um, if modders can make gun customization great again for Fallout 4, why can't you be do it for this game? <laughs> okay, what well, I'll utilize my technical background in this a little bit because I, I am a software engineer during the day. As soon as you open up your your game for modifications via an API, um, those are those become attack vectors, um, and then and then honestly, that API can only really be used on the PC, so you can't really duplicate that on on uh, the Xbox or the PlayStation Five or Four. Um, so I, I mean I understand why they're hesitant to uh, provide the the hooks into the APIs for, for modifications. Um, that's, I, I know modifications are fairly common, but uh, resistance to opening your game up for, for officially sanctioned mods it also has a lot of resistance as well. No, that's fair enough. Um, Brad Soup says, right, so we talked about tracer rounds on the original video. And uh, Brad Super says tracer rounds are in the game. They're just very rare. Um, he had an M4A1 with tracer rounds before he scrapped it, not realizing he couldn't get tracers back by building it. Um, what do you think about that? I don't think I don't think tracer rounds are represented in the game outside of the uh, uh, the magazine handed out by the engineer. Um, what you're seeing on screen is is a visual representation to help the gamer visualize where that bullet is going, not necessarily a full intent tracer. Right. Yeah. But... Say that again, bud. I said I can say that better than he could. That, yeah. That's exactly what I was about to say on that one. That's fair enough. Okay, so... We we mentioned on the original video as well that um, it, it, that Jeremy had mentioned about refilling your ammo in a bivouac, um, and uh, Quinn Ahab has mentioned this. Um, and he said uh, he'd noticed the bivouac ammo refill thing himself. He'd been trying to figure out what bullet type allowed him to carry the most uh, total ammo. Um, he used to think it was by gun type. Um, but he said the P9E, the M4A1, both use 5.56. When you get a refill, you get about 450 rounds total. He's not sure of the exact. I think it's more than that, actually. Um, I'm going off the top. He says he's going off the top of his head. But he's also noticed that some guns have smaller magazines, like 10 rounds, and c can carry uh, more rounds total than a gun with a larger magazine, like 15 rounds. Uh, he's not sure of the exact numbers, but he said it's an interesting topic. Um, but I know this is the kind of stuff that you notice, Jeremy, because you notice the bivouac uh, refill issue. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I can't, I can't explain what they're thinking on some of these. A perfect example is the Breda M9. The Breda M9 ships with and is always shipped with a 15-round magazine. Um, as the standard size magazine, the only time you're going to get a 10 round magazine is if you if you find yourself in California. Um, very few states restrict magazine sizes, but to have have that magazine in particular on the, on a standardized 15 round magazine for the M9 just doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't know where they're getting the information from as to these magazine sizes. And we did touch on magazine sizes before because I remember I had talked about how the uh, 
the surefire magazines were were all off as well as some of the magpoles. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure where they're getting their magazine information. If I were to guess, again, I think it's all coming back to uh, play balancing. Because there for a while, the M9, the M9 is a very good weapon. Um, and early on in the game, if you get the M9, you, you, it, it serves you very well. Um, so I think putting a 10-round magazine in it to kind of throttle that back so that's not overused, a.k.a. game balancing, is probably the reasoning behind it, but I can't guarantee that. Um, if it's not play balancing, then it's just poor research. Okay, but I think that's a decent explanation, to be fair. Um, Spectre 576 has said, the longer the barrel, the more um, continual pressure there is on the bullet, which means um, higher muzzle velocity. Suppressors can actually increase muzzle velocity. Ammo and barrel length are the primary factors to muzzle velocity, assuming you're using the same powder charge. Um, I'm not quite sure what part of the original video that he was kind of commenting on. Uh, like when I read that comment, I'm not 100% sure whether he's saying that we got something right or we got something wrong. Um, what do you think, Jeremy, on that? Well, <clears throat> he's, he's addressing two different things here. First, he's talking about... Uh, it's called dwell time. That's the time between when the bullet passes the, uh, before the bullet passes the uh, gas port in the barrel, uh, to cause the, the cycling of the weapon. Um, once it passes the gas port, the gases start to bleed off and actually runs the cycling and loads the next round into the chamber. I won't go too far into that, uh, but he's right. The longer the barrel, the more continual pressure there is on the bullet because of the increased dwell time. So it doesn't need to higher muzzle velocity. Now, so, now, second point he talks about is suppressors can a, can actually increase muzzle velocity, and and I got to tell you, this is true. In the very most minimum sense of the word of true, um, suppressors on the average add fifteen to twenty nine feet per second uh, additional muzzle velocity uh, because they continue to hold the gas behind the bullet past the, the crown of the barrel. Um, I don't think that's significant, uh, considering that most an AR-15 uh, bullet travels right around 2,900 feet per second. So an extra 15 feet per second, less than one half of 1%, probably not even worth talking about. But it is true. It is true. Okay. That's cool. Thank you for that. Great explanation, as always. Um, Ryan Conlow has said that he thought in the original video, one thing that wasn't explained very well was to do with weight. He's put, um, depending on how real player wants to play the game, adding weight to your weapon system adds strain to the user. Um, main reason why most infantry men and women keep less on their guns. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I don't believe we talked about this at all in that last video. Um, this really has nothing to do with the with the gunsmith. Uh, but no, I it, think, it, it, I do think a it, weight system should be implemented. It should affect your it should affect your stamina. Uh, it should affect your your the amount of of uh, equipment that you can carry, the amount of ammunition you can carry. Um, I think that it should all be factored in. I I know Ed's got some thoughts on this. Go on, Ed. Bring it in. I also think that it should affect sway, the weapon sway. Obviously, if you're going to have more attachments onto a weapon, you're going to have a lot more weight onto your weapon. You're holding the weapon up for... Especially if you're trying to aim down sight with the rifle. You know, you're going to have that thing up for a while. Weapon sway should be added into it, a lot more of it. Um, and then it also should... Yeah. I don't want to sit there and say that they should add it because I know how Ubisoft frickin' works and it's the same thing like with the ammunition. Um, but it should also have like its own individual, like each optic should have its actual weight. Not even just optic, any attachment should have its actual weight like it does in real life. So that way that plays a factor. I'm and then scared. you really have to go into it you have to go into your mindset. What is my main mission objective? How am I going to be engaging this mission objective? Um, 
Am I going to go on CQC? Okay, well, let's get this thing a shorter barrel. Let's get this thing hooked up with some reflex EOTAX, stuff like that. Maybe a grip. Maybe I don't need that 40 mic mic. But, yeah. Well, I think, no, they, that makes sense. I think they kind of shoehorn weight into the mobility uh, factor because it does affect yeah. how quickly you move from side to side. Swinging your rifle from side to side, um, you know, the the time it takes for you to go prone and recover from being in prone. Um, so I do think weight is considered into that, but I would like to see it broken down into a separate factor. And that all, all the decisions that you make for that particular firearm have an effect on that. Well, one thing's for sure is that the statistics for the weapons in the game currently are, are completely off. Um, they are some of the weapons they're really far off um i'm not quite sure what's going on on with that and that there's weapons that are quite small that you'd think the mobility would be high but the mobility is really low and then there's big clunkier weapons where they've given it really good mobility it doesn't make sense it should do you know what i mean it should be the other way around but Anyway, okay, so uh, next one, we've got PH88. Now, we've mentioned a few things here that we did bring up about handguard options, barrel lengths, uh, mag selection, but he says it's frustrating that, you know, why the 516 is forced to use just PMAGs, but, um, but others, uh, you know, get all sorts of different options. Um, he says, what about trigger options available for all rifles? Um, and he also says that slings because he thinks that, in a way, slings should be part of the gunsmith, in a way, I suppose. Um, he said, you know, what proper slings so these guns don't look like they float um, when behind the shoulder. What do I you think? Know. I don't know about slings being part of the gunsmith. I think slings, I, I agree with him. The slings should be there. 100% agree. Uh, they should have been there from day one. Um, I don't know about putting them in the gunsmith. I think I would, I would count them as an accessory. When you go to do your customization, that way you can change the color of the sling. Um, but uh, I would just say, here's your sling, and then your attachment points, be it uh, uh, QD or or the uh, the older fashioned uh, D rings. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, just that you have a sling. So I, I I mean I totally agree, and that, the other points that he touched on there with the P mags and things, I think we all discussed them last video, um, and I and I do think that most of that comes down to licensing and, and money, because they do they do a lot of these companies will require a license to use the uh, the visual visual representations of their of their magazines. Of course, yeah. Now, the next comment that we had, I'm not going to read all this because it was a really long one, but it was massively detailed. Um, it was by um, Jake Rush, a really excellent comment where he's talking about what we were discussing about the barrel lengths um, and the fact that the twist is a factor for bullet drop. Um, he says about the fact that it, the US military requires its infantrymen to be effective with an M4 and M16 uh, out to 500 yards with iron sights and the fact that that's totally impossible in the game currently. Um, and he actually breaks down uh, different ammo types um, for yardage. Um, it's quite impressive, actually, all the stuff that he's put in, put, he's put in there. Um, and he talks about different ballistics, things like that, um, and how the bullet drop really is completely off um really excellent comment um but he said with the next ghost recon title likely being exclusive to next gen consoles why not take advantage of the extra power of those consoles and make the enemies visible at a greater distance obviously we did discuss this um in length in that original video has anyone got anything that they would like to comment on more about that no i i, I would question. my only comment would be I got that, a question uh, for you, sir. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead and finish your point, and I'll ask after. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I don't think, I don't think they're looking at the right things to calculate the bullet drop. Um, uh, they're probably off some, some obscure algorithm that they're running based on on the bullet type and 
and the type of the of the uh, rifle itself. Um, I I can't even guess what the rhyme or reason is behind the bullet drop, but uh, it, it definitely needs to be fixed. And Jake, this is a, this is a really good post, sir. And uh, I I applaud you for uh, doing the research and and getting that in there to help other people. Absolutely. Go on, Ed. To you, and this is probably going to be a question that a lot of people are thinking of, but I want to ask you, since you have a lot more area of expertise in this than I do, he mentioned a 223 in his uh, in his top description and replaced, I guess, for the 556. What I know, a 556 is more or less a 223 with just more powder behind it. Does that more uh, does that powder amount affect the bullet velocity, and is it is substantial enough to actually make a difference? with that yes yes actually the uh i can't speak to the amount of powder but i can tell you it's a different powder and it produces much higher um chamber pressures which then translate into the bullet going down the barrel at, at a higher speed um so i mean there are some differences between 223 and 556 uh, one of the reasons you can't or you shouldn't use a five 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 six nine two two three barrel is because it's it's outside the pressure range that the two two three rifle is rated for. Hopefully, so, that um, alleviates some of the questions in the comments later. Okay, yeah, cool. I'm not so, sure if that exactly answered your question. I was trying to figure out what exactly the question was, or if it was just clarification. Maybe yeah, it's just a are, clarification. Again, they are they are two different two, rounds. Two, yeah, you can shoot a lower pressure bullet in the same in the five five six chamber safely. Uh, you cannot safely shoot a higher pressure five five six bullet in a two two three chamber. What effect? Uh, I mean, obviously, muzzle velocity would increase its range. So, right. I mean, you've you've got more you got more chamber pressure there, so it's going to push the bullet out faster. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no. Hopefully, that clarification alleviates some of the comments questions. Okay, so um, Budka, or Bud, I think I'm pronouncing that right, Budka, um, he's also, uh, he's commented quite a long comment, but I'm going to pick one part of his comment out. And he's, he's talking about the fact that when you're using the lasers in the game, do you think that we should have a laser that you can have the option to switch on and off? So... For example, at the moment, you can you you see your laser with your night vision on. He's saying that should we have lasers that you can use uh, when the night vision? Do you know what I mean? Different types, so you can have lasers that can only be seen with night vision that enemies can't see, and have lasers that are uh, can be seen by anybody. Right. I think what he's talking think? about lasers in the visible spectrum and the lasers in the infrared spectrum. I think is what he's trying to get at. Yeah. Yeah, most probably. Um, do you think the laser, when used in the day, should be seen by the enemy? Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I got an interest. I got an interesting take on the lasers in this game, and it's probably not going to be very popular. But uh, I don't think the laser actually works like a laser in this game. I think the laser is there as an attachment simply to carry uh, some uh, stats. I see a lot of people that rely on the laser, and then they talk about how the laser isn't isn't accurate. Um, it's because the laser is just just a visual representation of the part. It's not necessarily meant to be a pure aiming implement, <laughs> um, it, like much like the uh, much like the rangefinder doesn't tell you the range. It just carries stats, and much like the bipod doesn't act like a bipod. It just carries stats. I think the laser is the same way. Uh, obviously, because because of the way the laser is implemented, it will eventually cross the path of the bullet uh, during its flight time. So, uh, and I've done some research on this, and and from what I've seen, it looks like they're they're uh, zeroing the. If you were to say that the laser was a natural laser for its intended use, it looks like it's zeroed for about 42 meters, which nobody zeroes for 42 meters that I know of. So I, I'm of the opinion that the that the laser can be used, um, but I'm not of the opinion that it should always be used. Uh, because, I, again, I think it's just a cosmetic item. 
with an effect that goes down the screen but isn't necessarily meant to be a precision aiming implement. Okay, thank you for that. Right, so Ivan Renov has said that in Wildlands we had three barrels, um, but in Breakpoint we only have two. And also mentioned about what we did in the original video, we said certain models of weapons weren't the same. He said he was waiting for the SA-80 and they added an inaccurate scale version that's a carbine and looks atrocious. Um, what do you think about that? Uh, lots of people complained about the SA-80 actually saying how bad it, how bad it looked. I think there was a lot of offended ex-British soldiers um, that said, what is that that they've given us? That's not that's not the right thing. Yeah, I think there's a lot of poor representations of firearms in, in Breakpoint, uh, that being one of them. Um, I mean, if you're looking for my opinion, uh, I agree. Uh, I think there's a lot that could be done visually with some of these, these firearms that... Uh, would be a much better taste, make much more sense for their militaristic role. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't know who makes the decisions on how things should look. I think a lot of these decisions are made so that it gives them variety, so that it gives them a little bit of a, a personality versus another gun that may be similarly looking. That's fair enough. I, I mean, obviously, we've discussed the barrel lengths before. Um, the fact that you know we we agree with what he said that there should be more barrel lengths and that should definitely be uh, an integral part of the gunsmith being able to swap different barrel lengths out to you know have a, a more accurate weapon um apollo patriot has said that he wants drum mags for all different guns um now i know some weapons wouldn't work with that but you probably know more than that than me jeremy well, I mean, there's quite a few weapons that have drums. Um, drums themselves are not very reliable. They they tend to malfunction quite a bit. Um, and you don't... I can't speak for the military, but the last I knew, uh, the military does not use uh, drums for most uh, assault rifles and, and small arms. They stick to the box magazines. Fair enough. Okay, so Jay Plays has said that basically a good weapon customization in a game will make people go and buy the game. It said this, he's bought certain games before because of how great the gun customization was. Um, and he said, compared to other games, this one is not particularly good. Um, it's definitely not even the best of, of the Ghost Recon. It definitely isn't the best of the Ghost Recon games. We know that. Um, it is a shame, though, isn't it? Because um, it, this this game, where it's had its falls, regards to gear score and raids and things like that, that people don't like. Um, the thing that it does do really well is, you know, being able to base clear and do all that kind of stuff. The milsim stuff does work quite well, so it is a shame that the gunsmith is still it's it's definitely improved, but it's still restrictive, don't you think? Oh yeah, I 100% agree. Um, I, I think that uh, the number of people that you, number of players that you would lose from a bad gunsmith, is far greater than the number of people you would gain by having a good gunsmith. So it's in their best interest to have a good gunsmith uh, right from the get-go. So uh, again, a lot of a lot of good things have really been added to the gunsmith. I don't want to detract from that. Uh, but they do have a long ways to go, and it, it's a it's a it's a hard uh, hard thing to judge because I think everybody's idea of what the gunsmith should be is slightly different from everybody else. Agree. Um, I, Ed, was you going to say something then? Um, as far as the comment goes about buying a game for the gunsmiths, I mean, spend your money however you want. Um, I find it kind of uh, I don't want to say funny in the wrong sense of the word. Humorous, I guess, would be better. Back in the old Ghost Recons, our gunsmith was effectively, do you want an M16 with a 203? And if not, you get a sling. Oh, well, do you want an M9? Do you want extra ammo? Do you want a frag grenade? That's all you got. And now here we are 
don't know how many days later, or not how many years later, uh, and we're talking about what makes a good and a bad gunsmithing. And where I want to sit there and say that, yeah, the focal point of this being the gunsmithing, using it solely for the factor and saying that it's what will, I mean, obviously it's true. You bring in a good one, people are going to stay. You bring in a bad one, people are going to leave, and it's probably going to outweigh the amount that stay. But back in the day, we didn't have that. And it still was a very nice game. It was very, I mean, it was niche. Um, but it was the way that it drew you in. So. Do you think it's because of the kind of Call of Duty culture? Like Call of Duty is such a it's... massive game. that, And in all fairness, the modern warfare gunsmith was very good. Like, it was a very good gunsmith. Um, and I think people now, where they play a shooter, want, they just want that. You know, they want to be able to do absolutely everything. I must admit, I've spent ages to sit in, I used to in Wildlands, just tinkering with your weapon and stuff. It feels good. It, it, it's, it's part of that kind of military experience. They're trying to give you a kind of military experience to go and have fun with. And part of the military experience is, is the gunsmith. And I, so I do understand why people want an improved gunsmith. I mean, that's what we're making these videos about, I suppose, in the first instance. Um, but yeah, but we're, I'm going to go on to a point now quickly from uh, 1191971, because he brought up an excellent point that, Jeremy, that you brought up in the original video. Um, and I do think it is a really important point that we should touch on again. Um, he said that it was about the fundamental flaw of the game. Um, game balance is not restricting the player, but improving the opposition. Absolutely no military is going to dumb down their troops to give an advantage to the opposition. If they implemented a weight-based system, overbuilt weapons would have some negatives to the player i.e. reduced handling, accuracy, etc., uh, that the player would either have to endure or change their build, um, then add more opposition that is smarter, and then you've got a winning combination. Um, that's effectively what you said, wasn't it, Jeremy, in the original absolutely. video? Absolutely, absolutely agree with this, this commenter. Um, yeah, uh, why, why would you ever send a soldier out with a weapon that is purposely underpowered that just it just doesn't happen but but that is what they did effectively that's what they've done to try and balance the game but as we said in the original video it doesn't need balancing because you you know before they added ai teammates you were on your own yeah and you were a one man army Exactly. And so if you make the enemy AI better, you do not need to dumb down any of these weapons. You're going to need these weapons to be as good as they can be. Um, that was a really good point, and it was a great point when you made it initially, uh, to be fair. Um, we've got Booker making another, um, another one, um, and this is talking about you talking about the sound barrier. He says, using a suppressor does not make a bullet subsonic. This is uh, categorically not true. Firing a, st a standard round with a suppressor still breaks the sound barrier. You just lose a few, go a few, go a good few decibels. Uh, you still hear the crack. And that is the sound barrier uh, being broken still. And he says maybe there was a possible mix-up in the explanation because he's sure that you already knew this. Oh yeah, I mean, you, what makes it subsonic is the ammunition. So uh, I, I, I don't know if I didn't explain it well or if he misunderstood what I said. But I don't, I don't feel I misrepresented it. I had uh, brought up that the uh, they were talking about subsonic ammunition with the ammunition types, and I said I believe that's already in the game. Um, and I gave that that example of the minus twenty on the suppressor. Um, no, that he's he's absolutely right. That is. That is the way that it works. If you put you put a supersonic bullet and run it through a suppressor, it's not going to become subsonic. Right. Well, not every weapon can be an MP5 SD either. 
This is true. Okay, so the next comment we've got is, um, this is another long one, so I'm just going to read a, a small part of it. Um, this was from Scooter66. This was a really good comment as well. Um, and he is talking about um, about the fact that when you hold in an assault rifle with modern day holds and manipulations, it seems confused. His example is a C clamp or thumb over bore grip isn't an object attached to a gun. It's a certain way to hold the gun with your support hand. The thumb is on the top of the rail and available for pushing any buttons mounted for lasers and lights. Uh, this is true when using any type of foregrip attached. Um, he said, these days, no one who shoots uh, shoots a lot understands uh, efficient body mechanics for holding a gun. Um, he holds them like the characters do in this game. Um, he says that modern warfare has much more correct support hand animations uh, than this game does. Um, he is saying that uh, the game's gun holding animation seems to be modelled after soldiers from about 20 years ago. Do you agree with that? 100% agree with that. Um, again, I, I, they didn't understand what I was trying to say. Um, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the thumb overboard, or the C-clamp as most people call it now, um, is a pretty common shooting stance. However, it is not, as far as I know, last that I know of, it is not something that is taught in the military. As far as I know, the military still uses uh, modified isosceles, modified weaver stances. Um, so they do not hold their, their rifles like that. Um, which is where I think Ubisoft got the idea that they need to have their hand on that, that vertical grip at all times. Um, even if it makes your arm all janky and, and cocked out of whack. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I would like to see them use the uh, the thumb over bore method. Uh, typically, you would use a vertical grip or an angled grip as a uh, as a hand index. Um, like on my firearms, uh, I use the the thumb over bore, and uh, when I set my firearms up, um, I I stand up and I hold hold the uh, firearm the way that I would aim it, and then I figure out where on the rail to put my uh, vertical foregrip or angled foregrip uh, in order to back it up against the back of my hand. So that, that provides you with consistent indexing all the time. Um, so there are, there are a lot of advantages and a lot of reasons that, that thumb over board is a popular option now. But again, I don't think that's, that's uh, something that is uh, in the uh, military training regimen at this point. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, Cougar Hunter, one excellent name. Um, he has, he, he, I'm just going to read certain parts of his, um, he's basically saying that he believes that, um, the lower power does not mean a smaller hole, uh, to see through and less field of view. Um, so low power equals wider view. Um, he's talking about, um, like digital scopes. Uh, what do you think about that? I'm not sure I understand the, the question. He's basically saying, um, he says they've got, for example, he says that a T5XI has a uh, a normal crosshair and not oversized chevrons or horseshoes that just block the view. Uh, the digital scope would be good if they got rid of the four black triangles around the center point. Um, and lower power does not mean a smaller hole to see through, um, and less field of view um, is lower power equals wider view. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, and I agree with him for the most part. Um, usually the, I think he's, what he's talking about is the viewport that you see through the optic. Um, so that uh, uh, when you hold that, that rifle up and you're looking through the optic, the size of the, the viewport, um, and I think he's referencing the 5TXI, uh, where you can switch it between the uh, 1X and 4X, I think it is. I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, and you can see a, uh, uh, a focal distance change on the screen. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Um, but uh, yeah. uh, for the most part, he's right. 
Uh, typically, the, the size of your viewport is going to be directly affected by the length of the optic. So the longer the optic is, the, the more it tends to funnel in. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you can have high magnification and shorter optics, too. It just depends on what glass you choose to use. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, he's, he's correct. Yep. Okay, right. We're going to do a couple more. I know we're, we're, we're getting on now. So um, Brian Mackey has said that he thinks right now that every gun in the game is basically a laser beam. It's just a matter of aiming. You point and shoot, and everything's like a laser. Um, that they're all too, you know, they're all too similar. Um, my own personal opinion on that is that I totally understand where he's coming from. Um, I I don't necessarily completely agree uh, because you know we've done uh, weapon testing videos on the channel and stuff, and I, and I I do know it's a big difference sometimes when I use one weapon compared to another. But there are plenty of weapons in the game where you swap I swap one for another and you it's barely noticeable. But you did explain that really well on that original video that there should be certain weapons that shouldn't feel really any different to each other. What what do you make of his comment? Well, I can't see his comment on the screen. Can you read it again? Uh, yeah, he basically saying that every every gun in the game is a is a is like a laser beam that they're all too accurate. They're all too accurate. Um, I I don't feel that they're overly accurate. Uh, and there are things that you can do to increase the accuracy. <clears throat> For instance, on a lot of the rifles, you have the option to put the uh, flash hider on, which is ridiculous as it sounds. <laughs> the flash hider reduces flash; it doesn't increase, it doesn't decrease the size of your groupings. Um, but the the in-game effect, and it even says on, on the screen, is that it tightens up your groups um, so they become more accurate. Um, I don't feel that they're they're laser accurate. I don't feel that's the case at all. Um, matter of fact, if you if you fire from the hip, um, or just do it over the shoulder and watch watch your uh, bullets go down range, you'll see that there's variations in it. Um, so I don't agree with with the laser like at all. Um, I I I actually feel like there's too much uh, uh, variance in the groupings down range. I feel some okay, of the things were done. He says something else really interesting. He said um, that what about to enhance realism if they added weapon malfunctions? Well, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Um, I mean, how do you implement that without pissing somebody off? Honestly. Yeah, you, can you imagine if you had them on the raid? and you? <laughs> you yeah. just about to finally kill that last boss and your gun jams. Yeah, that that would be great. Um, there's nothing I would like to see more than no man murdering his gun, trying to clear a jam. Um, but uh, again, I feel like that's something that uh, I think that opens up Ubisoft to a lot of unnecessary scrutiny because uh, you'll get guys that are like, "Oh, well, this this is just happening way too often." Uh, or this is happening at certain times and I can reproduce it. You know, the game's cheating. And can you imagine some of the, uh, can you imagine some of these companies that they've got the licenses from? I don't think they'd like it either. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah. There was a game that had a question about it. Uh, can't remember. War Thunder. A lot of uh, people were sitting there asking about historical actually with the tanks and the game developer of war thunder basically said well with historical accuracy how much would you like to be that player who has a tank that does not want to start does not want to have its engine even turn on can't move plus to track just going over a slight hill and then you're rendered useless for the rest of the game so I don't know if malfunction should be a good thing because nobody wants to be that guy in that tank. Um, yeah. I think that's a gameism that they should they should keep where it doesn't. And I agree happen. because I agree because games are supposed to be fun. Yeah. You know, you're playing it for fun, and if you start going into that kind of level of detail, you know, it, 
that, yeah, I mean, there's got to be a cutoff point, and I think maybe that's it. There's um, uh, so many other unintentional malfunctions in this game. I, I don't think adding an intended func- malfunction would do it any 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 good. No, probably not. Can you oh, imagine? That, mind you, then, do you know what though? If they did have a if they did have a, a malfunction in the weapon, um, they wouldn't have to uh, they wouldn't have to get no, the nomad voice actor to say anything other because they could use the same sound effects for when he falls down a hill exactly. you imagine when he's gun when he's gun where he's gun jams he just does that Ugh. Uh, that would be it there's other things jams, that come into this when you do this too there's uh uh preventative maintenance on, on you'd have to at that point they would have to uh implement some sort of uh means of cleaning your gun wire or bivouac to prevent jams and malfunctions. Um, there would have to be parts wear on each of the guns to prevent that would induce malfunctions that you would have to replace on a regular basis uh, at in the gunsmith. Uh, there's just a lot of follow-on things that uh, uh, while the malfunctions on occasion, maybe once every 10,000 rounds or something like that would probably be okay, but there's Tons of other things where that's there's gonna be that one person that that's not okay with. I need a way to keep this gun from malfunctioning. You provide it to me. Now we're talking about a whole lot of lot of uh, follow-on things that need to be done in order to support the malfunctions. Yep, I agree. Hmm. Okay, so we're gonna do two more. We've got two left. So one of them is from uh, General Aladdin Handsome. And he says uh, the 556 five, rounds uh, in an AK-12, or an AK-12 used 556 five, rounds, um, and the AK-12 can have a damage of 21 RPM. Um, but compared to the M4A1, um, that has 27. He says they have the same bullet. It should have the same impact in reality. True or false, Jeremy? Uh, mostly true. Mostly. <laughs> Mostly, I, didn't yeah, think, most, most. I didn't think an AK-12 used a five 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 six. I thought they Actually, used a uh, Russian. They well, they do. There's Russian five five six two. That's steel case. It's actually quite underpowered, oh, cool. um, which will make a Ooh. difference uh, in, uh, in in the kinetic energy downrange. Uh, well, um, steel case rounds. Steel case rounds have thicker s- steel walls, so they can't hold as much powder. But uh, but anyways. If they're using Russian Milserp ammo in the AK-12, that could accommodate for some of the differences. I don't remember what the differences were right off the top of my head, but there are slight slight differences. The Russian Russian 5.56 is slightly less powered than the brass case 5.56. Um, however, the AK-12 is last I knew is also available in 5.45. Can't remember what the other. There's a third one. There's three different vari- There's three different variants of the AK-12. So uh, who knows which one they're they're basing their statistics on? Exactly. Good point. Okay, we're going to come on to our last comment now, um, and it is from Chaka Chaka thirteen. He says uh, twist rates play uh, play a d- difference as well, or are those understood to be the same? When talking five, five, six, and barrel length, he said um, direct uh, impingement or gas piston, for example, free floating handguards are known to be more accurate than older knight style RAS handguards, uh, where the strain of vertical grips can literally change harmonics. My real question is, though, is what uh, what keeps people playing this game? He seems to think that the developers uh, don't like the player base. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, you know. it's me playing the game. It's the only one of its type, and I'll be the first one to say it. As soon as a competitor comes out, I will probably jump ship. Okay, if they get the things right that this game has not, for example. But would you play it if it wasn't open world? Do you would want, has it got to be open world or not for you? Okay. It can be on rails. It doesn't matter to me whether it's on rails or open world. I, I personally I enjoy the open world. Um, I, I like the idea that I can I can at a whim just decide to go somewhere else. 
I just prefer the open world to what in Wildlands. Um, and I, this is not the video to discuss that because we can do that in another video and we will be doing it in another video. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, anyway, I uh, hopefully that you've obviously that's not all the comments, there were plenty of others, but a lot of them were just talking about you know that they enjoyed the other video and things like that. Um, uh, or, or talking about specifics they'd like to see in the game. Um, so we just wanted to talk about the actual comments with regards to the gunsmith. Um, once again, massive, massive thank you to Jeremy and a huge thanks to Ed as well for coming on. Um, if you want to join the Discord, the link is in the description below and it's also on the front of the YouTube channel. Obviously, both um, Ed and Jeremy are both on the Discord. Uh, if you want to come in and talk to them, you can, I'm sure. Um, and uh, any further things that you want to say on Gunsmith before we head off? No, I just want to reiterate how great it is seeing these comments. I mean, there's a lot of really good comments in here, some really well thought out things. And uh, I encourage people to uh, both comment on the video itself. And uh, I really, really encourage them to join the Discord so they can come in and actually have a... Uh, a, uh, a back and forth conversation on it rather than post a message and wait for an answer. And, uh, 100%. I'm, I'm always willing um, to talk to people. I talk to people all the time right now about different things. I don't know everything about everything, but I will answer where I can. And if I don't know about it, I'll tell you. But uh, yeah, if you want some interaction on it, yeah, come on in and ask. Uh, there's myself, there's several other guys on here that are gun, gun guys as well. Yeah, we've got lots of um, ex-military and current military guys on the Discord as well who we would like to chime in. Um, so jump on, have a chat with us, have a chat with me or both of these guys. Um, but until until then, hope to see you on there. Um, we will see you on the next video. Take care and um, stay safe. Bye-bye.